Hey, Jake here. And uh, we got to pay some bills over here at Three Point Perspective uh, Podcast. So this, uh, this episode is sponsored by svslearn.com. It's an online learning platform we created because we all taught at art schools and realized you could get the same level of education without the enormous price tag. With courses from the three of us and dozens of other published illustrators, SVS Learn is the best way to get an art school education at your own pace and for a fraction of the cost. Start your free 30-day trial today at svslearn.com slash three point. So Lee, you have, after, after the holidays, uh, you have a new scar. I have a new scar. I got a new hair. I, I have a mohawk. If you guys want to go to the uh, YouTube channel and see it, I've got a mohawk. That is that is special cut for my Colorado driver's license. I love having mohawks in driver, <laughs> driver's license pictures. I've had them in like three of my driver's license pictures. Um, so that's why that's why that's good. But yeah, I got a. So I when you scar. get pulled I'm, over, they they uh, you, you get a chuckle right away. That's right. They're just like, they, they have to do, I like when they do like three glances up and down to see if I'm who that is. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I got a and scar on my face too. because uh, at the airport, big time. Oh, they, they kind of really scrutinize. They'd like squint their eyes a little bit. Like, I don't know if this is who he says he is. Um, so yeah, over the break, you know, we, we just got back from the holidays over the break. I was working on my house. I'd moved to Colorado and, uh, and I had, an, uh, to make a long story short. You got in a knife fight. <laughs> I got, <laughs> That's I'm what you people, should say. I told my son, I was like, we're new here. Nobody knows us. I can say anything. Like I got in a, a, a fight with a bear. But this <laughs> injury, um, so I'm working on my house and, and, and I, I, long story short, the electrical panel is not connected with hinges or anything. It's kind of like wedged in there with the, these tabs and uh, it was stuck and I'm trying to get it out and I, Finally, I'm pushing on it, it releases, and it flies in the air, and I look up, and the thing comes down on me like a ton of bricks and goes through my mouth, like where your mustache is, goes through my skin all the way and hits my teeth. Oh, man. <laughs> it and was, knocks you on your butt, right? It knocks me out. I mean, yeah, like I'm kind of like, uh, I don't want to say knocked out because I wasn't like laying there motionless, but I would, you know, for a second I was out and then all of a sudden I'm laying there not knowing what even happened and blood is just pouring uh, on my face. I can feel like, you know, it's hot yeah. and, and, I'm, yeah. and I'm confused and I thought my teeth were knocked out. Mm -hmm. um, it was insane. And so I, I got myself up and I, I kind of looked up and like, okay, this is what happened. I kind of sourced it out. And then I came inside, tried, looked in the mirror and I could see my teeth through my skin, through my mustache. <laughs> like I could see if like I opened zombie. it up. Yeah. It was like a zombie. It was crazy. And then, so I was like, I don't know what to do. So then I called urgent care and I had to log in online and I'm dripping blood all over my desk and it was crazy. Jeez. And I had to log in and then, you know, I'm in a queue. So they're like, we're going to call you when your spot is ready. And mm -hmm. so I'm waiting there and I'm like, I don't know what to do. So I went ahead and got my tools and I went ahead and wired this plug while blood <laughs> is just pouring. I don't know why. I was like, it really <laughs> bugs me to leave something halfway finished. It's sort of part right. of my OCD. Um, and You're so, the luckiest uh, unlucky person I know. Because <laughs> weren't you saying like the doctor's like, man, if that hit your nose, you would have lost your nose. Yeah, it would have cut, eye, you it cut an my eye. nose off. Yeah, yeah. It would have it hit my lip, your face. anything. Just you could have gotten a lobotomy. <laughs> <laughs> but I didn't tell Will that. I told Jake this. But the worst part, this is a crazy little thing. But I have a weird reaction to chemicals, like uh, any, any, anything. Um, mm -hmm. And I always have. Either I'm really sensitive to something um, or I, I'm not sensitive to it. It's just a really bizarre kind of chemistry that I just have had my whole life. And um, I'm at the doctor's and they're doing the Novocaine. So they're going to do stitches and they're going to do, I don't know if it's Novocaine, but whatever that numbing agent is on your skin. Mm -hmm. And they give you a shot and it hurts. It's like a lost sting. And then they inject the, uh, the numbing agent and that hurts as it spreads, you know? So they're going to do six of them and then I'm going to get six stitches. And so they're just kind of doing this around my face. And that's supposed to last like 45 minutes to an hour. On me, it lasted less than one minute. <laughs> Less than one minute. And so I had to get the, 50 of those shots in my face. Oh, so they're like they to, stitching and, and shooting and, and stitching and at shooting. At the same time, at oh. the same time, the second they would pull the shot out, it would start to go away. Oh, 
How many uh, special brownies does it take to get uh, to get you really, really fried? Well, it may the take just pants. a crumb. It may take a crumb because I'm also suit like I was on a I was on a plane flight to Costa Rica. I took a sleeping pill because I never sleep well and I've never taken a sleeping pill before. But I was like, you know what? I really want to go to sleep. It was a red eye. Mm -hmm. um, I really want to sleep. I took take the pill. And then I had the, the whole thing where I, like all of a sudden they're passing out the drinks. I got like an orange juice on my desk and I go into like a light seizure and pass out on the plane, <laughs> completely pass out on the plane. And my wife stands up and just a full on like, is there a doctor on board? <laughs> <laughs> and so I wake up like, seriously, this one I was truly passed out for like probably 10 minutes. And I woke up laying across a row in the airplane with a bunch of people looking over the seats down at me. And I'm like, oh my God, what has happened? And I have a bag, a plastic bag over my head where oxygen Jeez. is coming through. <laughs> oh, that was from one sleeping pill. <laughs> so it's, it's just, That's it's a kind of a consistent. I'm glad you didn't through. wet your pants. Oh, I could have. <laughs> 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 anyway, eventful, eventful uh, holiday. holiday. And so then they gave me stitches and they were like, do you want the clear ones? You know, we can't see them. And I'm like, no, are those blue stitches? Oh, yeah. Those are blue stitches. So I got the dark blue <laughs> stitches and it's right in the middle of my, where my mustache is. So I had basically a Hitler mustache made out of stitches. <laughs> right. And my wife had scheduled all these Christmas pictures <laughs> to be taken. <laughs> Which got canceled. I, got, I'm sure. It got canceled. I was game for golf. Why didn't you just but. Photoshop yourself? I, yeah, I, I, I told that Allison other. that and she's like, huh, if only Lee knew someone who knew how to use Photoshop really well. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was swollen too. It wasn't just the stitching too. It was swollen. Yeah. It wasn't a good thing. Yeah. And we only had it. <laughs> now, <laughs> it but now, good. now you could do photos with your mohawk. That would be good. Okay, so let me fast forward. The end of the story. The other weird thing is, I heal. I get in these crazy things, but I heal extraordinarily quick. And so, what should have taken a really long time, when they went to take the stitches out, which was only seven days later. They could barely get the stitches out because it was almost healed. And now it's been about two and a half weeks and it's almost gone. Like you can't even tell it happened. It's amazing. Except it's, you have that funny bump. It's a little bump right there. Can you see it? It. You should pop honestly, it. Honestly, it doesn't. You wouldn't notice it if, <laughs> right. if you I mean, if considering you didn't know the story. it's only two and a half weeks ago. I mean, right. it, it, it will probably be gone. Totally. What I want you to do, though, is, is with the Mohawk, have a nice full Tom Selleck mustache. Should I do that for the driver's license picture? Yes. All right. Get going on it. Get going on it right away. All right. I'm going to do All that. Right. You ready to start this? <laughs> we should it. probably start. Okay. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Three Point Perspective, the podcast about illustration, how to do it, how to make a living at it, and how to make an impact in the world with your art. I'm Jake Parker. I'm Lee White. And I'm Will Terry. And all three of us are professional illustrators. We've all illustrated for all the major publishers. Together we've published somewhere around 75 books, children's books, and we've all taught illustration at universities. Each week we come at you guys with different listener questions and we try to answer as best we can with all of our vast levels, years of experience. Um, sometimes we argue, sometimes we agree. Do we ever agree? We, but each uh, time more often you learn than, something than not. brand new. More often than not, <laughs> it's gonna be a pretty agreeable brand spanking new brand spanking new. Spankin new you're gonna learn something <laughs> brand spanking new maybe okay before we get into the questions um i want to re-emphasize we had briefly mentioned this before but lee has an email problem okay <laughs> right now he sent me a text showing i tried to send him an email he's like i didn't see it i didn't get your email what's what's going on and and previously the day before he told me he has six thousand six hundred plus unread emails in his inbox so i no wonder he didn't get my email it's 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 lost in this ocean of of emails there and so yeah. my advice to him and this is to everybody out there you know we're, we're into this new year if you haven't done it already it's time to declare email bankruptcy. Take all those emails, <laughs> put them in a folder, and just say 2021 email bankruptcy, and then start fresh. 
And it is, I do this every year. It is the most wonderful thing. <laughs> you just I sweep mean, you them go, under the rug, basically. You You're go just through, like, there's a, <laughs> right. and you know what if happens is I get your mail. I get people that email me going, Hey, Jake won't email me back. Um, can you get a hold of him for me? Well, and, that, and I'm not getting paid for that, by the way. <laughs> Well, I'll tell you this. I it was it, w- another little cathartic thing was I started about six weeks ago when I moved and I started remodeling this house. I said I'm not going to open any emails, and I'm not going to open any regular mail either. <laughs> and so now, so it's oh like my you're god, just dead so, to the world. Yeah, I just stopped. I just said, you know what? I'm not going to do it. And, god, and it felt so good for a while. And now, I looked at the stack of regular mail. I mean, this includes bills and. You know, all kinds of stuff, you know, just a mm-hmm. huge stack. And now I'm going through them and I'm paying all these late fees. And stuff. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's, an, it's uh, an expensive decision, right? It is. Like, <laughs> stupid. No, but here's my decision. And I'll, I'll throw this is my little tidbit of advice in this whole bad advice segment. Um, is you, you got to focus on something. And yeah. sometimes I just said, you know what? I'm not going to focus on anything else other than what I'm doing right now. And that's what I did. Good. Yeah. No, there, there's something to that. And that's sort of been my my thing for this year is and, and I I talked the talk last year. This year, I'm going to walk the walk. And the talk is you you really do clear out your mornings for creative work and and you don't let anything creep into that. You schedule phone calls and meetings in the afternoons. You don't check your inbox until noon. And, and you do the creative work one drip at a time, you, you, you just chisel away at it. Right. And, and eventually the, the creative work will get made and happen. And all this other stuff, all this other, like these fires that need to get put out, they're going to get solved. Problems are going to get solved. The, the work expands or contracts to the amount of time you have to give it. So you leave your afternoons to handling the emails and the administrative stuff and the bill paying and, and all that stuff when you're more likely for me personally in the afternoon is when I am tapped out creatively mm-hmm. and that's when I, I I slink away to social media or to YouTube videos or to you know wandering around the house and snacking and things like that's that. A good idea. And, but if but if I know like oh shoot I've got an inbox inbox I need to check I've got um, a meeting I have to go to a call I have to do um, I'll be present. I'll be able to do those things and and they'll get done. And I still have had a morning where I created something. Something exists that didn't exist before. So I'm picturing you slinking. <laughs> slinking, slinking away. House. Yeah. It's, it's like a slinky. Just kind of, <laughs> are you waking up early for this creative work? Or are you just on your normal schedule? What are you doing? Uh, so far this year I've been I've been getting up early and doing it before the kids get up. And then pausing to like get get everybody breakfast and out the door and then resuming it and then doing my workouts in between creative work and administrative work. Uh, that but, was my tip to you, right? When you yeah, do yeah. the four hour block and then do your workout yeah. and then doing yeah, it's good. Yep. Pulled that good from stuff. Lee. Uh, I don't know what I'm gonna do in the summer though in Arizona because working out it, it, like I like to run you and our it. Our, mm-hmm. our 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 weights and the whole setup is in the garage and it's just too hot in the middle of the day it's even mm-hmm. too hot in the morning sometimes wow. but there's a rec center up the street from me like two miles away so i think uh i think i'm going to maintain this and just go to the rec center when it's too hot mm-hmm. i'm trying to talk got an air conditioned into track. uh moving to colorado so we're all in the same spot we're going to open a physical location and then <laughs> you don't have to deal with those summers that's right <laughs> That's right. Goes, me and Will can go snowboarding. Get Jake into snowboarding. Yeah, Jake, you need to get into snowboarding. I I know how to snowboard and I do it when I can, but it's not going to be a thing that takes over my life. I you can't. Need a I can't afford that right now. To make the right decisions. Should, maybe we should have a podcast. A snowboarding podcast? No, like a, <laughs> an art podcast. Oh yeah. Okay, let's do it. <laughs> okay, here we go. Here we go. First question: Was Lee White a voice actor? Hi guys, love the show. This comes in from Craig from the UK. 
Really inspiring stuff. Uh, this actually isn't a question. I just wanted to bring it up. <laughs> now, this is more of a statement than a question. As I've listened to the podcast, I've often felt I recognize Lee's voice from somewhere, but can never put my finger on it. I was watching Gargoyles with my daughter today and realized immediately who Lee reminds me of. Lexington. So all he says, that's all, folks. Keep up the great work. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm scared to check out Lexington because I, I, I realize I do not have the Will Terry smooth voice. You know, <laughs> and I don't have the Jake normal guy voice. I've got this like weird hybrid voice. That's and you, just kind you of didn't all voice over the place. you didn't voice Lexington in the, the 90s cartoon Gargoyles. No, I did. <laughs> OK. <laughs> OK, good. <laughs> uh, no, I did. <laughs> Okay, first real question. Uh, This comes in from Javon, Encroaching College Crossroads. Hey guys, I'm emailing to ask a question about whether attending an art school is a good option for me. I'm a high school student halfway through my junior year, and I'm coming up to a point where I have to decide on what I have to do once I graduate. I've always had an interest in art and aspirations to enter the field. However, I'm not confident enough in my skills and drive to go to an art school and eventually make art in a work environment. Here's my question. Is it smart to take a risk and go to art school, or would it be better to go to college for something more generic and later sharpen my skills and explore art-related opportunities once I've got a solid job? Thanks for the podcast and the advice. What do you guys think? This is is such a... a, um, It's a question that everybody has when they're young. Yeah. You know, um, it... I want to look into the... We all want to look into that crystal ball and see, like, you know, what's the best option? And yeah, well, where am I going to find the most success? The well, there's thing one that, little to, inch. Oh, go ahead, Will. The, the thing that to remember is that um, we know people personally who have gone every route you can imagine to success mm-hmm. in art. And some of them have gotten full-on careers. Um, uh, and... Um, professional careers um, and then gone into art and we're getting ready to interview someone who has a very professional career in the medical world who's also very accomplished in illustration um, so there isn't really an answer to this from, from my perspective on what you should do there's the safe what we would consider the safe route which is to get a job Mm-hmm. Because for a lot of people, it's hard for them to get work as an artist. However, I know so many people who went the safe route who were like, I should have just done what I, <laughs> I should have gone into art like you because that's what I really wanted to do. And now I'm struggling to try to figure out how to get there. And it's mm-hmm. really hard now. It would have been a lot easier if I had done it when I was young. Mm-hmm. So I, I have a ton of advice here. Um, (laughs) you're going to disagree with Will. (laughs) I am going to disagree with Will a little bit. I think there's, I think there's a, there's a middle ground here that hasn't really been talked about, but there's one thing about the question that needs to be broken down. It said, it says, I'm not confident enough in my skills and drive to go to an art Mm. school and eventually make art in a work environment. If you said, I'm not confident in my skills, but you have the drive. I don't know. That's the one answer. Yeah. Not having the drive is is the bigger problem. The skills can always be attained. I don't care if you mm-hmm. if you have the drive. I mean, that's what art school is for. Everybody's like, oh, I'm not good enough to go to art school. Art school is for that. That's what it's right. for. <laughs> it's building up right. the skills. Um, and believe me, you don't have to have a ton of skill to get into an art school, despite what it feels like in high school. And you think everybody's a great artist in college. They're not. They're struggling with the same stuff mm-hmm. that everybody does in the beginning. Um, but even without the, the skills and the drive, my advice to this person would be, it sounds like um, you're not ready to make a decision either way yet. And so I wonder if postponing this, like taking a year, working a, a jobby job, you know, whatever, um, uh, doing like Uber or something, and taking some art classes and seeing if there's more clarity at the end of a year. What I hate right now for young people is the and parents do this a lot to their kids, is like the forced choice. You just graduated from high school and now you got to go to college. Oh crap, mm-hmm. well what do I do? I got to pick I gotta pick this path that now you're going to study for four years and then eventually be either pushed into some career you don't want or, now, or then have to diverge and change careers later where it's really difficult. So postpone this decision if you're mm-hmm. not ready to make it either direction. Yeah, yeah. And, and I would say that that drive is a key factor here. 
I would say you're going to get into, say you do pick art school, you're going to get in, into that. Everyone there has this, you know, the same, they feel like they're maybe an imposter or something. There's going to be one or two kids who are like super good, amazing. And everyone's going to be like, oh man, they've got it all figured out. And even those kids are like. Those kids don't make it. <laughs> they're like. They really oh, they don't. don't Most of the time, those guys don't. They're, sometimes they do. Mm-hmm. That's true. But a lot of times those guys um, are big fish in the small pond. And they don't value they re- what they have, and they don't they work relax. hard. Yeah, they relax. Yeah. And then when the going gets tough, they just kind of wither away. I've seen that so many times. Here's what I here's the advice I would give you. Um, I, so I have a kid who's who's in his twenties now, and and my advice I kept giving him, and he wasn't good in school, didn't have good grades. Um, he he wasn't super driven to like do college or school or anything like that. And um, what the advice I gave him was just make stuff. Just every day, make something. Work on your art and make something. Because he loved, he loved to draw. And so all he did throughout all high school for four years straight was pretty much made a comic strip every single day. And not all of them were great. But every once in a while, one was like really good. And, and he would post them on his Instagram account and he made what ended up being like a hundred plus really pretty good comics and a bunch of ones that were okay. He even made one that became a meme. <laughs> like it went on to become like a worldwide meme that people have used, hmm. but wow. that wouldn't have happened if he wasn't, um, if he wasn't just like, like if he was stressing out and worrying about, oh, what do I do? How do I do it? The other thing I saw with him doing these these daily comic strips is he actually got better at his art. He got better at like thinking through ideas, ma- you know, making and finishing a thing, and his drawing got good too. And then at the end of after he graduated, um, I worked with him on showed him how to like do a Kickstarter, run and launch a Kickstarter, and we collected all of his drawings in a book, and made a kickstarter video and put it all together and i showed him the whole process and and the book funded and he he didn't sell a ton of them and we still have a ton of these books in the storage unit but he made a book a a finished a finished product that he put out in the world and and it's sort of like you know this this accomplishment it gave him this this feeling of like yeah i can do something is he the greatest artist no is he, a, is he a really good artist? I love his stuff. His style is amazing. It's really developed. And has he gone on to art school yet? No. Right now he's he's doing a a, a service mission for our, for our church. And what's cool about that is he's in these situations where um, he's learning about life and world, the world, and like people's pe- real people with real problems. And and that I think is going to end up helping him more than just running into school an art school right away. You know, he took Mm -hmm. a couple of classes at community college, whatever. The thing you got to remember too, is like, is like you're on your own schedule, your own timeline. Um, and, and the world is going to say, Oh, as soon as you graduate, you got to boom, get into college. It's not for everybody. It's not, it's not absolutely necessary. You could take a year, you could take two years and figure out life and experience things. And like, like Lee was saying, have a job. Um, you'll, you'll learn a, a ton from working a job uh, for a year, for a couple of years. I mean, know? the cool thing you is learn- there's so many jobs that are flexible now that allow mm-hmm. this. Like when, when we were growing up there, you either, you know, you're part time or full time. And that meant mm-hmm. 20 hours a week or 40 hours a week. And now it's you can work eight hours, you can work 12. It's on your mm-hmm. own schedule. There's so much that you can do. It's 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 yeah. sort of amazing. I didn't start so, college till I was 30. So you got time. Yeah, you got time. Right. And and what I would do, I'll boil it down to this, this advice, right? And and I like what Will said is like some people need college, some people don't need college. Some people go and take a job and wish they hadn't. Some people take the, you know, go chase art and wish they hadn't, you know? <laughs> so here's my advice to you. Art being an artist, whether you're an illustrator, whether you're a concept artist, whether you're a filmmaker, whether you are a musician, whatever, it all rests upon you making things. Mm-hmm. And you just have to get into the habit of making and finishing things. So you're a, a halfway through your junior year now, 
set a goal that for the next five months during this last semester, that each month you'll just have made a piece of art, some sort of thing that you can hand to somebody else. And, and whether that's a comic, whether it's something you painted, whether it's, you know, but something really like you could put, you know, hand it to someone and point to it and say, this is the thing I made and see if you liked that process and you like doing it. And I wouldn't worry about did I, was I a good artist? I wouldn't worry about, did I, you know, did I, um, get the lighting right or the shadow right? Just worry about making and finishing things. Okay. And, and then see how that goes. And if you enjoyed that process and, and you want to do it some more, then this is definitely a thing you should chase and continue throughout your senior year, making art, improving, trying to master it. And then look at, at art schools that you want to get into and don't pick like, um, what, what's the bad art schools? The, the ones that are just like the pop <laughs> For up. profit. Yeah. Or, yeah. yeah. I mean, go to the best one you can that makes a difference. So community yeah, college if, is not the same as a dedicated college. Right. If, if you can afford it, if your parents have some money that are kicking into this art school, is super expensive. So, and you don't have to go to all four years of art school. You can go to one year, you can go to two years, but Find a really cool art school, but then also like supplement whatever that is with online education. Mm -hmm. um, that's why we started svslearn.com because um, um, we saw that there was just some things lacking and, and things not available to everybody that should be available to everybody. So look at that. Look at places like so, Schoolism. So many look places, at, yeah. Well, yeah. Let look me, at drawbox.com. <laughs> let me pipe in with this that our curriculum at SVS Learn is complete. I mean, we have the same curriculum you would get at an art school. I think it's more. And I, I, I would argue too that, it be, but you know, without uh, oversell, I understand. Yeah, I mean, like, but but the thing the thing is, you can get everything you get in an art school mm -hmm. online. The difference is, some people need someone to kind of hold their hand. So. It, ironically, what a lot of people are paying for in art school is the accountability of grades, mm -hmm. you know, getting, mm -hmm. I mean, that's really what you're paying in some cases, six figures for is accountability because, mm -hmm. because, uh, some people won't take, like we have all the classes, right? But if someone does ours, uh, at svslearn.com, they have to have the self-discipline to go through each class and do the assignments and and really work hard on their own some people can't do that some people really need uh, a school to say you will take this class you will take this class you will take th take this class mm -hmm. and and here you're going to get a grade and if you don't show up for class you're going to get marked down <laughs> and you're going to your right. grades are going to suffer yeah and we don't do that and and um some people don't need that right yeah it's true right. That's a good point. So, so get some education, make some stuff, and then make that decision whether or not this thing is for you. I can, uh, you don't have to make that decision right now. Can I add something on top of that right too? Now. There's there's yeah. one thing I want to add here. Have I ever? Have I, I don't know if I've talked about it on the on the podcast, but have I ever told you guys about the ice cream decision? When you wanted to have an ice cream cone, but you decided not to. <laughs> What does no, this a, have to do with art? It has a lot to do with art. It'll, it'll, it'll make sense in a second. It's a, it's a conversation I was having with my wife the other day. Uh, when my kid wants ice cream, mm -hmm. that is like the last time that it's a pure decision. Like if, if you're going to, if I ask my kid, do you want to get an ice cream cone? The answer will always be enthusiastically yes. There's mm -hmm. no downside to that decision. We go get ice cream and he loves it there. So it's just mm -hmm. an easy decision. That's the, that's the, only time in life I think where the decision is clear cut and that's where I'm going with this is like I was talking to my wife saying I wish as an adult I had the ice cream decision where do you want to do this thing 100% yes no doubt about it there's no <laughs> downside it doesn't happen anymore there's always like well if I do that then I give up this or yeah I, there's it's cost just, oh, you're, to it. Yeah, there's, yeah, you're you know. weighing it all out. And I'm like, man, I want one decision as an adult that's just a pure yes. And my point is you're not going to have it. Even if you wait a year and you take some classes and you do a part-time job, the decision then will not be 100%. The decisions mm -hmm. we make now are not – I'm doing this tarot deck that I'm going to Kickstarter in the spring. I don't know if it's going to work. It's not an ice cream because mm -hmm. it's not like, yes, it's 100%. It's guaranteed, and that's what I'm doing, and I'm so happy. I, there's always doubt. 
Um, and I just want to put that out there because there's never a lot of times people want to wait until that decision feels like I know exactly what I'm supposed to do. And my point is, it's not coming. You're going to have right. to wait and then yeah. pick. Yeah. And that's where integrity lies in. Like I had it explained to me once that integrity is doing the thing you said you'd do after all the feeling has evaporated. <laughs> like, like. You know, you may decide, oh, art school, yes, I'm, I'm all into it. And then you get into it and you realize like, oh, I have to do assignments. I have to like, I, I suck at this. <laughs> That's not what I, I thought to, it like, was going to be, as so you know. many things. Um, so it's going to, yeah, it's going to be hard either way. But hopefully that gets you into the right mindset, the right thinking um, of where you need to be. Sorry, it wasn't yep. like a, a simple, yeah, you should go. <laughs> That's an ice cream decision, yeah. It's, yeah. It's 100%, one, yes. Another add-on to this is... No matter what you do, whatever discipline you're, you're thinking of, there's a line. Imagine a line from the person who's the worst at it in the world to the person that's the best, right? There's a line. Mm -hmm. And when you start on, on something new, you're somewhere in that line, usually to, towards the back because you suck, right? Mm -hmm. and every, every time you switch, you're pretty much going to the end of the line. And I think a lot of young people don't realize that when... When things start to get a little tough, when they realize they have to start working, they want to switch majors. They want to switch in, from one thing to another. And I've seen that a lot. And I, mm -hmm. I just think that you, as a young person, you need to know that you're, you're, are you really wanting to go completely to the back of the line again Yeah, on something new? Just something to yeah. think about. You know, working for a living, like doing something for a living has been like a uh, an aspect of being a human for the last 10,000 years, right? You like, mm -hmm. you got up and you did something and in return you got food <laughs> and mm -hmm. you were able to provide for a family or something. It's only the last 50 years where it's like, Hey, you could pick something you actually enjoy. Um, and so I think there needs to be like a, take a step back and think, okay, there's going to be some level of, this is just a job and I'm doing it in order to make a living. Right. And have to, you have to like find where that threshold is for you. And for some people, man, we're just still talking about this, aren't we? And for some people it's <laughs> like, I can handle working this mid-level um, management position because I've got, you know, uh, good benefits, good insurance, good paycheck. And no, it does not feed my soul. And no, I, I don't, seriously believe in in the product that my company makes but i can then devote the other 40 hours of my week that i'm awake to snowboarding or pinball machines or you know whatever it is that you're you know mountain biking or whatever mm -hmm. right um i think though if you have an ability to create and to and to make things you also run the risk of taking this thing that you love and turning it into like a real chore and, 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 and taking like all the fun out of it too. So one of the, one of the other options here is, is maybe art is a thing that you do for fun and, and it gives you everything you need out of life just to do it for fun and not to attach any sort of monetary like value to it. And you take that job that, that you do for the, the paycheck and the benefits and, 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 and the insurance and all that. And that is a perfectly legitimate and a good way to live life. You don't have to do art as a living. Good deal. Okay, next one. Mm -hmm. Next one. Uh, Becky says, what's in a name? A rose by any other name will still prick. Thank you for your podcast. For those of us who are established in one career and branching into the illustration world, it feels like there is a risk in regard to our names. Which information do we want people to see when they search us? I'm working towards writing and illustrating children's books and in the education field where books live. Do you recommend using your own name as an illustrator? Why or why not? Do you use your given names? Why or why not? How do you determine what name to use if it isn't your own? And what are the benefits of using your own name? Thank you for your honest thoughts. Really quick, I, for many years, my online persona was Agent 44. Um, and, and that just stemmed from very early, like, 2000s uh, internet 
Um, I don't know if anybody had the real name on there. <laughs> like it was, you sign up for a forum, you get a domain name or whatever, and it's usually, you know, something dumb like funky fresh 22 or something, you know, like, <laughs> like you just have that <laughs> online name. Mm-hmm. And at one point I realized like, oh, I do want to get into making actual published works. And on those books, you know, are they going to have the name Agent 44? Or are they going to have the name Jake Parker? And um, and I decided I'd rather have the name, I'd rather be known as Jake Parker than as Agent 44. And so I, I switched everything. I switched my handles on social media. I switched my website domain name. I switched all these things over to over to my name because I wanted my my name attached to it. Now, there was some thought process because my actual name is Jacob Parker, mm-hmm. and that's what I went by for the first twenty one years of my life was Jacob Parker. And then oh, really? when I switched, yeah. And then when I decided to go into being professionally an artist, I thought, let's simplify this. Let's make it a little bit more, let's let's eliminate a syllable and make it something that has a little bit more alliteration or not alliteration, but a, a, a nice sound to it. So I went Jake Parker and, and I just stuck with that. And now that's, that's what I, that's what, I, how I introduced myself. That's how everybody who's met me since then calls me. But it's funny to like run into people who I knew in high school. Jacob, how you doing? That's how, that's how I know I've known them for, for a long time. Um, uh, so that was a deliberate decision to, to do that. So on all my legal documents, you know, contracts, it's, it's Jacob Parker. But my, my professional name is, I guess, is Jake Parker. And, and in some instances, it's Mr. Jake Parker, because that's my domain name and, and my Twitter handle as well. Um, but I don't see any problem with you, like, picking a cool, like, catchy name and having that be your the name that's on your books and the names that you're known by professionally. And then you have, like, your normal name that you're that's, like, personal. I don't see anything wrong with that. I think what do you guys you, think? I think you... Um... We, you know, we grew up at a time when the internet was brand new. And so for us, it was easy to get our names. I think one thing that a lot of young people are dealing with now is their names taken. Mm -hmm. So they're dealing with that, number one. Um, I think that there's an advantage to having your own name in regards to social media, because when you sign up for a social media account, you have to use your name. So if you're... Like for Facebook. mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, so like... um, and being able to promote using your own name is an advantage for us. Whereas mm-hmm. if you have a, a different name on online, you know, other, you know, what you're marketing for is your business name. It, it could, I mean, obviously you can have a professional Facebook page, but you can't have a, a personal one that matches it. I don't know if that's a consideration for some people or not. I, I, I like that. Um, So, yeah, I mean, it's definitely harder. Wouldn't you say it's harder to promote under a different name? I don't know. Like, have you guys heard of, have you heard of Andy J Pizza? He's, uh, he's like an illustrator. He's sort of in, in the same space as us, as far as like online and, and sharing, you know, Mm -hmm. educational information and stuff. And that's not his last name. That's not his real last name, but Mm pizza is catchy and it's rememberable. And, uh, and it imply, I mean, do you ever eat a pizza when you're sad? <laughs> like, do you ever All order? The time. A, That's the only time I eat pizza. I'm usually crying <laughs> into my pizza. I mean, uh, typically, uh, a pizza is associated with a party a or fun, with yeah. a social thing or something like that. And so it's such a good, a good name. And, and, you know, if he ever, if he has a book that comes out or if he has, you know, makes a film or anything, that name, Andrew J. Pizza is going to be on there and mm-hmm. it's memorable and it's catchy. So my advice here is uh, if you don't like your original name or if you want to keep some sort of anonymity to your personal life, go knock yourself out and go make your, your Dr. Seuss name and 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 go for it but if you don't really care and you're fine with you know blurring that line then then use your original your mm-hmm. your original name like, if you if you plan on doing something really embarrassing it's probably better to have a pseudonym 
Because <laughs> then you can just get another one. Yeah. <laughs> right? Like, Not attached to your own name. So there was a guy right. who uh, was in Portland that had a, a catchy little, um, I guess it was a pseudonym. I'm assuming that his last name wasn't actually Superstar. His name was Brett Superstar. He's the illustrator. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Pretty funny. Yeah. Easy and to you've, remember. You've used, Wheatley, you've used Antonio Blanco. Antonio Blanco. Yeah, for my <laughs> landscape stuff. <laughs> <laughs> it's fun. You can right. have fun with it, but you know, I, it does add complication to it because as you just heard with Jake's little history, as you go through, you change. I mean, like me and Will are just who we are and then mm-hmm. we don't have to worry about changing it. So uh, mm-hmm. I don't know. Yeah. All right. Next one. Uh, this comes from a person who wished not to be named. They said, hiding behind brands, NDAs, and art directors. Love the podcast, Will. I really enjoyed your art book, Jake. I've been following your career since flight and Lee, I'm looking forward to support your tarot deck Kickstarter. So this is a, this is a person who's, is really familiar with this. So they say, I studied illustration and after graduation, I moved into toy design and have had a successful career, not to brag, but by doing so, I've been able to work on concept art for TV animation and feature films. All right. So this guy's really legit. Doing I've it. recently gone freelance and I want to build up the illustration side of my business. I'm feeling burnt out, only making blue sky concepts and technical work that is hidden away by NDAs. And it's so NDA just FY stands for non disclosure. What's the A? Agreement. Part? Agreement. There you go. Non disclosure agreement means that you work on something without um, ever pr- promising not to share it, like on social media or, or on your website or anything like that. So a lot of his work is hidden away by NDAs and is often overly art directed. I want to create work that I can actually show off and hang my hat on. This may be a weird question, but do you have any advice for an artist that struggles to make and show their own original work? Maybe I've been hiding behind big brands and art directors for a while. Also, I struggle making something without the pressure of external deadline. Boy, I I can relate to this guy. I, I can. And... And uh, while you guys are thinking about it, I'll just I'll just say this: like, I made a deliberate decision in, I think it was 2015 or 2016, that I would not take on any freelance projects that didn't uh, have my name on it. So not even NDA stuff. Like, uh, I decided I was only going to do book projects, either books I kickstarted or books that I um, that my name would you know be displayed on the cover. Or, or I could be attributed to on the back cover or something like that, or to do certain projects where uh, I would be credited in, you know, in credits so that I could, uh, so that it, it, essentially each of these things could be kind of like a, a calling card. And I said no to, to stuff like commercial work where you design a bunch of concepts for commercial, the commercial airs, and nobody knows who made it. There's no credits at the end of commercial. There's no... Um, database for who worked on what commercials and so I started saying no to that and what happened was like my career blossomed in a way where um, I was doing things a little bit more publicly and I was sharing things a little bit more publicly and I was getting work um, that that work from these things because it was more public so that sort of solved that side of it the problem of what what do I say? You know, what do I work on that gets me more um, more of this this kind of freelance work? The other side of it is how do I you know how do I I struggle making something without the pressure of an external deadline? Um, I struggle to make and show my original work. You know, it's not art directed. It's it's coming from within essentially. So how do you you guys do a ton of original work? As far as I know, you don't have, um, you know, external deadlines coming. You know, there's no external deadline for the the tarot deck, Lee. There there wasn't an external deadline for your Littles project, Will. What drove you drove drove you guys to make that? How did you like? How did you go from having nothing to having something and having it be a success? What do you think, Will? You've done it more times <laughs> than I have. You know. I, when I read this guy's um, email, I my mind keeps going to the fact that he, I think his creative energy is being used for the um, clients that he's working for. 
Um, because I don't know, like in we all we have are our own experiences, right? And for me, I have, um, you know, I have these uh, ebbs and flows in my life of wanting to produce something really creative. It doesn't happen all the time. It, it used to more. Uh, mm-hmm. I used to have this this hunger, and I and I think it was more um, in my twenties and thirties when I couldn't I couldn't create something that looked like my vision. Mm-hmm. You know, so I'd have a vision up up here, and I couldn't achieve that height with with what I ended up producing. Mm-hmm. And so it was like this uh, stretching, constantly stretching for this almost unattainable quality. I couldn't get to. And then, you know, in my 40s, and I started to be able to get there to what I was, mm-hmm. you know, to where I thought. And now in my 50s, I I feel like I can get there pretty much every time um, if I really mm-hmm. want it. Your and, abilities match your vision. Yeah. And I, um, and so now it's not as much of a goal to like, I wonder if I can make something really good. It's what do I want to say and 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 what and the things that I work on, I really want to make them count. And the thing that the probably the biggest thing that has helped me make the things that I've wanted to make in the last five years is um, s- saying no to some of the freelance work that was that I used to take just to pay the bills because that was sapping my my creative energy, mm-hmm. you know. And, um, so from my perspective, I would think that's probably why this person who will, shall not be named, um, is not already doing his own stuff and putting it out there is, is, that's what I would guess. And so I would say, and that's a, it's a tough transition to, if, if you're already working, we've, we've talked to quite a few professionals in the industry. I'm thinking of one right now who is a mutual friend of ours who, is kind of a who's who in in uh, in storyboarding in Hollywood. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know who I'm talking about? Possibly, and, yeah. <laughs> I can think of five different people. Okay, well, <laughs> this one particular person who went to school in Utah, um, he just lamented several times that, you know, if not for all the work that he's got to do, he would be working on all these personal projects and how in the world do you have time to work on personal projects, you know? Yeah. That applies to the five different people. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Right. And so at some point you have to, I think you have to decide what do I want to leave in this world? Because I mean, your life really isn't that long. Mm -hmm. And for me, I really wanted to leave some things that were just mine. Yeah. You know, and I have more things that I want to leave and Mm -hmm. it doesn't leave room for spending all my energy on, on client work, which there's, there are stages. We've talked about this before on the podcast. There's, there's stages in your career. And I feel like as you get towards the, the latter half or the latter third of your career, that's when a lot of illustrators or artists in general really think, what am I going to leave behind? Mm -hmm. You know, Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's interesting. Um, I think to give yourself deadlines, I think I think too many artists start to just make work, make the actual artwork without thinking about the overall plan. And I think that mm-hmm. that's one thing that me and Will have done really well is that we're like, I'm gonna. If there's always an end kind of goal, whether it's go, I'm gonna have a gallery show at this gallery. Well, now there's a deadline. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Or or there's an art show. I need work for that art show. Uh, so I need to make something for it. So there's a deadline kind of inherent there. Even making your own stuff um, that doesn't have a, a formal deadline like an art show would, like uh, I'm going to run a Kickstarter. Well, you start talking to a, a printer to even just figure out, okay, how much does, does a book cost that I'm going to make? You know, So I'm going to make a book. I'm going to Kickstarter it. And you start talking to a printer. They say, okay, when are you going to print this thing? Okay. Oh, my gosh. Okay, now you put a <laughs> – it's sort of arbitrary. I'm going to print it on March uh, 17th. Well, now there's March 17th and, and the printer has now marked that. And so all these like arbitrary sort of just almost made up deadlines start to become real mm-hmm. because other people are involved and other things are involved because you're thinking about the output instead of just making the artwork. There's, you're making something like Jake was saying earlier, make, make something, but think about where it's going to go and how, how it's going to fit into the world. Um, 
and and then the deadlines start to line up a little bit. And so that's mm-hmm. what keeps me accountable a little bit is now the other people are involved. I'm starting to have, uh, uh, you know, all over the place, whether it's production or creative input, help, um, critique groups. You start meeting with even just your critique group. When are you going to do this thing? Oh, I'm going to do it and it's going to take me three months to make that. Okay, well, now that's the deadline. Yeah. So they're arbitrary, so, but they, they, they become real. I like that. I, I like both these. So Will's essentially like... Uh, the the problem here is a little bit of mindset, like oh I want to make it, but I'm, I'm I don't know how do I do it. I don't have the energy, whatever. And it's just like you have to have that that sort of vision of when I leave this world, what what will I have left behind? Will mm-hmm. it be you know five hundred editorial illustrations, or will it be like this really cool book that that you know touches people's hearts, or will it be you know this really cool thing that that uh you know got people excited so there's that and then i like what what lee's saying where it's like essentially every independent creator has to wear two hats and and i'm pulling from like like what happens in films you essentially if a film's going to get made it needs a producer and a director right and one is a logistics person and one is a creative person and the producer is the one that says okay i put together the team and I've put together the distributors and I got the money for the project. Now you have to make something <laughs> really cool. And the director's like, great, thanks for, you know, thanks for putting this together. I'm going to make something really cool. And then boom, you know, two years later, uh, a, a cool film comes out, right? Uh, super simplified, but that's essentially it. And so for you, like you have to wear that producer hat. And it takes practice and it takes and it's it's hard to shift from I'm a creative person to now I'm like planning the logistics of everything. And so my advice there is before the end of the year, plan to just finish a, a, a simple project, something, something digestible, like easily digestible, like a 30 page story. If you if you wanted, you know, if I was if I was a comic artist, it would be a 30 page comic, right? 30 pages. That's, you know, you could do five pages a month or something like that. Um, if it was a children's, you know, if a children's book illustrator, I would say, uh, a, a, a personal children's book story. You know, if I was doing, like Lee said, a gallery show, it would be, you know, 20 pieces for this gallery show or something like, I don't know, five pieces for the gallery show or something. Right. But, but figure out by the end of the year, I'm going to have this thing. And then, do all the steps leading up to what do, I, what do I have to do to have it finished by that? And what what I like to do is I like to make things that I can sell because, uh, because like the true, I think, measure of, of quality is if people will get rid of money <laughs> for it, right? They'll <laughs> exchange they <laughs> money for it. You could put stuff out there and, and people give you likes, likes are cheap, comments are cheap, mm-hmm. you know, follows are cheap, but if they'll actually buy it, that says something. So, and, and I look at like, I've got half a million, um, Instagram followers, but how many people actually like support me on Kickstarter? A thousand, maybe 2000. Right. So those, those are, so that's where you, you kind of want to put something out there for sale and say, here's the thing that I made because it, it, it forces you to actually finish something and put it out there. And so I would say, you know, we're at the beginning of these, this year here, there's still plenty of time. I would say plan on making something so that it is for sale and available to like ship out to people for Christmas, hmm. you know? Make something for people to give someone for Christmas to put under the tree or, or you know, something like that. So if you're yeah. going to do that and if you can fund it yourself, you're, you're in a good position. But if you need to go to Kickstarter, then you're probably going to want to do your Kickstarter in May or in July, you know. But um, even if you end up in a non-commercial aspect of that, I, I do want to point to the logical uh, mm-hmm. uh project of inktober started like that i want to get better at ink here's my now here's my parameters i'm going to do one new ink drawing every day uh, using these materials for 30 days you know what i mean and, mm-hmm. that, and that's fantastic it's just an art goal i mean maybe something happened at the end of that for i don't know if there was a commercial uh, angle with that first one that you did or hey i just want to do my own illustrations now here's well, that, these that arbitrary first one, things that first one i put all those drawings together in a book oh did and, you okay. and that was sort and of you like knew that my, was going to happen 
that was sort of my like I want to uh, I I had to justify also a little bit of like spending all my time on this mm. um, sure. uh, because m- I have and and maybe I'm broken to some degree but I have this this philosophy and this hard and fast thing where um, you need to like you really need to work on making products and not just having projects. And I did a whole video on that years ago. And this is something that like my friend Jed, who's, who's very big on this is, is, is like you having a project means there's no end point. There's no, like, there's no, um, measure of, is it going good? Is it, is it going Mm. bad? You know, like, but when you have a product, you finish the thing and you put it out there and do people want it? Yes. Then it's successful. Do people not want it? Then you may have done something wrong and it may not be the product itself. It may be all these other factors. Like, did you, were you good at selling it? Were you good at, Mm -hmm. and so, you know, at some point in my life, I might like outgrow this and be like, ah, I just want to like paint daisies (laughs) and I don't care who, (laughs) who buys them. Or the thing I actually am thinking about is I just want to make like dioramas, like cool little dioramas for no other reason than you do maybe my grandkids. Yeah. Maybe my grandkids just get a kick out of them. Uh, you know, so, uh, so, so that's, that's down the line, but for now I'm really interested in making things that, that people want to, to own and, and support me through. And so that's why I like attach all these other things to it. Like have a deadline for it, have, you know, have a, a particular person in mind that, that wants to buy it, you know, have something that's designed to like fill a gap in the market. And maybe that gap is just, I need to be entertained in a particular way, you know, that's that, that I'm not being entertained with, you know? So, so I guess long story short is shift your mindset, put on your producer hat, and then give yourself like these, um, these give yourself a, a, a finishable project by the end of the year, and put it out in the world. And uh, and I think that might solve some of your problems. You could still do all these other freelance projects and things like that, but I would just set a goal for for anybody who's in this position to try and do one personal project that you put out there a year. Uh, I should choose my word. And better. The, pra- the practical product. side of that. Yeah, the personal side of that, too, or, or practical side of that, too, like what Will's mm-hmm. saying is you can't just keep taking all commercial projects and think you're going to add this on top. So mm-hmm. it may mean a reduction of income if you say, okay, I'm going to mm-hmm. say no to a few things, which means you may have to reduce your um, expenses. And so mm-hmm. think about how that plays into everything, how much rent you have to pay, how much monthly, how much do you have to earn. If it's less, that means you can take less. That means you can make more things. Mm-hmm. And I think that's it for this episode. I, I will add on to that. Like with the way things are going in the world, your best bet right now is to buy some sort of muscle car and learn how to weld and just <laughs> add spikes to it. You know, We're going chains next. dangling from the, behind uh, it. The snow plow, you know, the wedge the snow, snow plow in the, the front. Wedge in the front. I think that's that's probably your best use of time. We and, did and as, as a group, <laughs> as a group, we we did all agree on that. The snowplow is the best zombie apocalypse car. Yeah, to have absolutely. Yeah, or maybe like a, a bulldozer, but they're so slow, aren't they? Well, and and they got the curve in the front, so you're going to capture a lot of that stuff in there. Oh yeah, you just mm-hmm. need to like you just want to clear it like a yeah, yeah you like want a, the, the zombie plow, train, like the zombie yeah. plow. <laughs> All right, let's start. Right, Should we tell people that we're going to come, that we're going to be uh, weekly? Are we already weekly? Yeah, we've been weekly. This? We've okay. been weekly by now. Wow. Yeah. Uh, okay, everybody, thank you for joining us. Three Point Perspective is made possible by svslearn.com. We're becoming a great illustrator starts. So your hosts today have been Will Terry, Lee White, and Jake Parker. We t- Will Terry can be found at willterry.com, and f- you can find him on, on Instagram at willterryart. Do you, do you even post on there anymore, Will? I plan to. I plan to. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Lee White can be found at leewhiteillustration.com and at leewhiteillo on Instagram. And I can be found at mrjakeparker.com and at jakeparker on YouTube. Podcast is produced by Daniel Tu. 
Uh, he's uh, our editor and kind of keeps things running here. Daniel2.co is his website, and two is spelled T U. Uh, special thanks to our SVS production manager, David Bro, for all he does to, to make sure this thing gets going. Uh, special thanks to Asa Shirtliff, our community manager and, and producer here at SVS Learn. Thank you to Lily Camille, Camille for our show notes. And a special thank you to our uh, admin person, Lisa Fott. So uh, there we go. And we will see you guys next episode. Put your uh, headphones down and go draw something.